The twin-engine plane flew over the island of Lampedusa. Sitting near the blades, Rosanna peered out of the window to scrutinize the old warehouses dotted across the island. Which of them was the old NATO base in which Minister Maroney intended to install the new immigration center, which had the inhabitants of the island on the warpath? Making the most of a few days' strike in Bologna, she went to visit her sister, Guiana. Filled with sudden interest and with the secret hope of finding a role that would suit her, one of those which, as an aspiring actress, she was so fond of. <laughs> Guiana introduced her to Kikero. Pleased to meet you, Rosanna said, thinking he's not in the least how she described him, the naughty girl. I don't understand why. Well, I'll have to find out. I'm on duty in ten minutes, Kiro said. Tomorrow, Saturday, there is another demonstration in the town hall square at nine in the morning. Of course, as there already is an immigration centre, Moroni has the brilliant idea of extending it and doing another one, Rosanna commented. What's happening in the town council, she asked. Maggiore, Kiro's brother-in-law, explains. Dino Rubias, the mayor, is a former seminarist, and you could never trust a frustrated priest. According to Mara Vatano, the mayor has betrayed her. And who is Mara Vatano? asked Rosanna. Angela Mara Vatano is the deputy mayor, Sarah answered. She belongs to the North League, the party that grumbles about the fool from the South. She has negotiated with Maroni in Rome behind the people, and so now she's dead as far as we're concerned. When they were alone, she commented to her sister, It's not as I imagined. What is there about him that you don't like? Well, he's married, his wife is Swiss and runs the Barrosa restaurant. We're just friends, Gianna clarified. The next morning, Rosanna straightened her black trousers and leather jacket in front of the mirror. She looked for Kiru in his brother-in-law's restaurant. It was after nine, and she could not find him. But Megori's wife showed her the way to the town hall square. Almost the entire population of the island had congregated to decide on the next actions to be carried out against the Ministry of Home Affairs. The mayor, Dino de Rubis, started the sermon saying, The president of Sicily did not want to come because he is frightened of the twin-engine aeroplane, the one we all use. Tomorrow he will come in an official aeroplane, a jet engine. A booing could be heard. The clamor reached the Via Roma and grew increasingly louder. Freedom! Freedom! They were the clandestines who joined the meeting. They asked for the posters hanging off the front of the town hall to be translated. They were slogans against Maroni, against Mario Marconi, the general governor of the immigration, and against Senator Angela Maravitano, traitor on the island. Rosanna asked in French to a boy who was looking at her closely, What are you looking at? Why have you escaped? Because we can't carry on living this situation. We are all piled in together. Our room stinks. He saw Kiru came up to him and asked, Who opened the gate for you? The guard, sir. The police. Who were fearing an avalanche, the boy replied. Salvatore Capello took the microphone and expressed the solidarity of the population of Lampedesta to the foreigners. I guarantee that in a day or two, they would take you to Italy by plane, he exclaimed. Enough, Pastor. Today we are eating couscous. Right now we're going back to the centre, Thera ordered, addressing the crowd. The tension grew between the police and the demonstrators. The illegal immigrants insulted the police. Bastards, wankers, freedom. 
They attacked and struck an ambulance that was trying to make its way quickly through the throng. The police started hitting people with their truncheons. The insults could be heard being exchanged between the cabaneri and the demonstrators. Kira and Rosanna were exhausted. In the streets, groups of North Africans could still be found. They came across a bus of police, which was patrolling, looking for future chips. Every time they found one, the driver whistled and invited him to get on board. When they got home, Kiro took out two tonic waters from the fridge, opened a cupboard, and after a while found a bottle of gin. He mixed a couple of gin and tonics, which they downed in one. Shall we have another one? Yes, let's. The following day at dawn, when Rosanna woke up, Kiro had disappeared. She thought that it had all been a dream. If it weren't for the fact that a body felt as though it had been beaten with a sock full of sand. The telephone rang next to her. She thought it was him, but it wasn't. It was Guiana. You're crazy. I told you he was married. His wife won't let him go. She's German-Swiss, a real sergeant major. Where is he now? Megori told me that there has been an attempted arson at the CPA. When Kiro got home, he was another person. Is there somebody else? His wife asked him a few days later. He said there was. Get out of here and don't ever come back again, she ordered. Kiro spent his days helping a friend. There was no shortage of work. The months passed slowly and every day he read the email he got from Rosanna and sent her his reply. He would never forget the wonderful feeling he had experienced that day on leaving home with what he had on and that whirlwind of freedom continued. Everyone knew that when Gaddafi felt like it, no more boats would leave Libya. A few days before Rosanna's arrival, what Berlusconi's government had been planning for some time happened. An agreement was signed with Libya that allowed any boats intercepted before reaching Italian territorial waters to be sent back. It was all they were talking about on the island. Berlusconi justified his position with a multi-ethnic Italy. Forget it, in his usual TV advert style. Now there are thousands of calls from mobile phones which spread the news. There is no work in Europe. One day it will happen. The pressure will increase again. The routes will go further east towards Egypt and they will arrive to Turkey. They are desperate and no government will stop them. The day arrived. Kiro and Guiana awaited the arrival of the aeroplane in the terminal. Rosanna turned up with four suitcases that hardly fit in the Fiat Panda. A few hours later, the telephone rang. I'm calling you from Palermo General Hospital. Your father had a stroke and was admitted this morning. His condition is serious. I think you should come immediately. They set off within a few minutes. <laughs> The funeral cortege proceeded. At the head, there was Baptista's wife, who was leaning on her daughters, followed by Kiro's wife, and behind them a large, compact group in which Rosanna, half hidden among the crowd, followed the procession, understanding that in Sicily certain laws existed that cannot be ignored or transgressed. Once it was all over, Kiro took Rosanna's hand and they got into the blue Fiat Panda. I'll show you the boat cemetery. We've got time before picking up your luggage and taking you to the airport, he said seriously. In 20 years, hundreds of boats have reached the island and they are chopped up 
and their remains are heaped up, filling the valley. Some of them, waiting their turn, look splendid against the immensely luminous sky. With difficulty, the car drove up the hill, which, winding its way, led to a large esplanade surrounded by a metal fence. Kiro drove anxiously as if he wanted to get there as soon as possible. He stopped the car, and as they got out of it, they were enveloped by a penetrating perfume. Can you smell the rosemary? It's blooming again, he said. Rovasana finished the sentence, saying in a thin voice, In the valley of the lost dreams. Si tout était doux, si tout était beau, ta mère aurait moi besoin. Ah, si tout était vous. Every year, Rosanna wrote a letter on Kiro's birthday, which he usually answered. In one of the letters, she confessed to him, Our lives crossed one day like two balls of fire and carried on in opposite directions but neither of our destinies would ever be the same again. One day, in another time and another place, our story will be written in one of my tales, and it will not have an expiry date because it will be constructed of the material with which dreams are made, and then, once more, in the valley of the open boats, the rosemary will bloom again. Quand tout devient fou, quand tout devient faux, l'amour, on a bien besoin. Poser mes yeux où, quand l'eau manque partout, demain j'ai vraiment besoin, je sais le monde imparfait, je sais. 